Let's read this account together, John chapter 20. It's page 109 in the New Testament. The New Testament is the second half of the scripture, so just page in the second half to page 109. John chapter 20, and we're gonna read from verses 24 through to verses 30. John chapter 20, from verse 24, page 109. Now Thomas, called Didymus, which simply means twin, and actually the root word of Thomas also means twin, so he's getting twin from both sides, twin, twin. One of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. John is very uh, focused to, to make sure we don't miss that and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. That's reminiscent of what he said at the, the last supper and what he taught about his peace. Verse 27, and then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I think everyone struggles with doubt at some point in their lives. If you read church history and you see who we would regard as the heroes of the faith, if you start with Adam and Eve and you make your way through Abraham and Moses and Solomon and Ecclesiastes and the book of Job, you can't turn anywhere and not see that we all struggle with doubt at some point. And I think we're prone to think that faith and doubt are opposites. And so, you know, if I doubt, then I've just got to kind of pretend I'm not doubting, will myself out of it because God's not pleased with doubting. But there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. But doubt can actually lead you towards certainty. It can lead you towards God. Tim Keller so beautifully puts it in his book, The Reason for God. He says, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. And that's an important thing. It's really an important thing what Keller is saying there. And and I've often thought about why are so many religious people afraid of tough questions, so insecure? Surely the the doubt is a test of our foundations and that's the way you test those foundations to see if they'll stand the test of time as Gareth was sharing with us in his testimony. An insecure faith that you've built only out of Jenga blocks that doesn't have any foundation has to try and protect it. It has to, because it's so insecure because the slightest knock of doubt and those pieces are scattered across the floor. Surely anything worth believing in is also worth questioning. There's a member of our church and a member of our worship team who grew up in a cult. And it's a well-known cult. And as he was growing up, he began to wrestle with things. He began to ask tough questions as maybe some of the teens do this morning and you've realized you've inherited this faith from your parents. You've just been told, we go to church, this is what we do, but you've never made it your own. And he began to wrestle. But the moment he started on asking questions and he's seeking for truth, the leadership shut him down. And eventually, after a while, they called him in and they excommunicated him from that church. Imagine his family actually writing off their son as an apostate, having nothing to do with him. And and I think only a couple of years ago did did he even see his sister and his mother after years of abandonment. You see, genuine truth is not afraid to be tested. You should have the freedom to come. There's no question that's too dumb. I remember when I first became a Christian, I thought, well, if I ask that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the only one in this Bible study that knows nothing about the Old Testament because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. 
And that might be you. You might be sitting in church today. You might have come for the first time and you say, I don't really know what am I supposed to do and you're trying to take social cues from everyone. But genuine truth is not afraid of being tested. Falsehood is threatened. Falsehood is always on edge because its nose is actually fraudulent and so it tries to kind of keep looking over its shoulder in case it gets exposed. But think about a court of law. If you are telling the truth, no matter what they come, the truth stands secure. Maybe you remember that story of the four guys that, you know, bunked work. And then the boss, you know, when they eventually got to work, said, where were you guys? And they said, no, you know, we got a puncture. And then the boss took them in one by one and said, which wheel was it? Which wheel was it? Which wheel was it? You see, falsehood just can't stand up. It's insecure. But the truth, if that was the absolute truth, they all would have been consistent. Now imagine I was traveling in the car with my wife, Liesl, and has, as has sometimes has happened, we hear a noise coming from the engine. Now I know what I'm sometimes stubbornly like, I just pretend that I don't hear those noises. And some of you know, you, there's that light on the dashboard that you just, you just ignore, and when your wife points, just, just ignore that, I know what I'm doing. Imagine she says, Justin, shouldn't we stop the car? Shouldn't we check this out? And I just, I say, no, 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 it's, it's gonna be fine. Why am I doing that in my arrogance? I don't wanna face the energy of it, the finance of it, the burden of taking the car in and just hearing bad news. It's better to just keep driving. If the engine hasn't blown up, well, so be it. Who can relate to that? Okay, at least it's not just me. I don't want a new nickname. But that's what doubt is. Doubt's a noise coming from the engine. It's saying, your soul wants truth. Your soul wants answers. You don't just suppress that. Like Thomas, he was honest about his doubts. It alerts us, and so if doubt leads you to investigate, that's a good thing, because there can be dishonest doubt, and dishonest doubt just says, uh, miracles, don't believe in them, don't believe in that, don't. you've just predecided. that's not an argument, you're just making some assertion, that's lazy. I mean, if eternal things could potentially be true, shouldn't you be investigating them? Don't you climb into an airplane and trust that airplane? Why demand 100% proof for Christianity? I can't give you 100% proof, but neither can you for 90% of what you do in your life. You drive over that bridge every morning to work, you just assume it's gonna hold you up. You don't know 100% it is. You climb onto that plane, you've never seen the pilot, so you don't require 100% of proof. I'm a Christian because I believe it's true, because I believe the evidence is sufficient to lead me to the truth. So I'm so glad Thomas stuck around because he had this week of wrestling on his own and with his doubt, and then a week later we see that he's with the others. And so I wanna say to all the doubters you here this morning, stick around, I'm so glad that you're here, because I know what that's like. I remember second year Bible college, throwing away everything that I believed because I realized even as a new Christian, I'd inherited this stuff and I started to build that foundation, investigate for myself. The strongest form of faith is one that has wrestled through doubt and come through the other side stronger. So what were some things that maybe contributed to Thomas's doubt as we look at our text? I just want to suggest a few. Number one, maybe what contributed to his doubt was his personality. His personality. We don't know much about Thomas, and we, I suppose we shouldn't build a mountain out of a molehill, but John has recorded certain things about Thomas which I think is important. And he seems to be more melancholy, maybe more pessimistic, maybe more prone to believe there's not a happy ending, more kind of just a thinker, maybe more of a realist, if we like. And in John chapter 11, Lazarus dies, word reaches Jesus, and the disciples say, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there. So Jesus wants to go back to Judea, he wants to go to Lazarus, the disciples are saying, this is crazy, you've just come from there, the people have been trying to stone you, and then what does Thomas say in John eleven sixteen? Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And I like to think there's probably a hint of sarcasm in that. But yet, beneath that sarcasm, before we give him the bad label, I think it's also evidence that he said something the other disciples didn't. He was actually willing to die with Christ. Yes, he may have been sarcastic, but he was willing to go, willing to die with his Lord. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples, in my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. You know the place to where I'm going. And what does Thomas pipe up and say? Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? It's like, Lord, please stop talking in cryptic language. We have no clue what you're talking about. I'm just gonna verbalize that, Lord. Where are you going? How can we know the way? We would wanna know the way. We'd love to follow you. 
And then Jesus answers in the most profoundly unique statement, probably in the whole of scripture, as a response to Thomas. Look, look what his sort of skepticism and doubt released in Christ as Christ brought truth and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So maybe as you look at your personality this morning, you're wired a bit like Thomas. You're not quick to believe, and that might be a good thing, because it also means you're not quick to disbelieve because you're not gullible. You like to question things, weigh them up, just think about them. But you need to be aware of how your background and your temperament and your personality can make you prone to doubt. Just be aware of that. But let's not be too hard on the Thomases in our midst because we've all been Thomas at one point. In fact, when the women ran from the empty tomb and they brought the news to the other disciples, think about it, Thomas wasn't really demanding anything that the other disciples hadn't already seen. And Luke tells us when the women came, uh, the disciples did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. But you see, honest doubt says let's investigate, not let's run away. The second thing that contributed to Thomas's doubt was no doubt, isolation. Isolation. Verse 24, Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And I like to think he might have been an introvert, drawing just energy in some sense from just being alone. He didn't like the energy of the crowd. And, and he probably just was reflecting and needed time and space to grieve. We all grieve in different ways. And often when we face doubt, we withdraw from people and community. And we might come to church and we look at other people and I've had people in my office say, I find it so difficult, I look at other people and they seem to have so much faith and this one is worshiping in this way and this one's dealing with this. And, and I say, what, if you could be a fly on the wall and see how many people feel exactly the same and, and, and you look at them and think they've got it together and they look at you and you, they think you've got it together. But when we doubt, we pull back from community group, we pull back from attending church. And maybe Thomas even thought, well, what's the point of joining all the others? I mean, Jesus is dead. The sooner we can just face that, the sooner we can move on. What's the point of getting together, reminiscing about the good old days? The good old days are still too raw and too painful. I mean, the cross had barely been taken down when Jesus appeared to the disciples the first time. It was Easter Sunday night. And maybe Thomas said, Jesus was the glue that held us together. We actually had very little in common other than Christ, and he's dead now, so I'm gonna go out solo. We don't know where he was. We don't know what he was doing. I think we all know those people we meet up with, people from the past. And yeah, maybe you've got them on Facebook as a friend, but you kind of think, well, actually, in the real world, we have nothing really in common. And you visit Cape Town, and you connect with them again, and you tell the same old jokes, and you reminisce the old school stories again, but you kind of think, what's the real point? There's, there's, there's not a relationship, and maybe that's what Thomas was feeling even in these moments. I think it's glaring in the text. Thomas was not there. And J.C. Ryle points out how much Christians lose by not regularly attending gatherings of God's people. The very sermon that we needlessly miss may contain the message our souls need. The very assembly for praise and prayer from which we stayed away may be the very gathering that would have cheered, established, and uplifted our hearts. I mean, J.C. Ryle's writing that a long time ago, but that's a challenge to us. We'll miss church for anything. We'll miss community group for anything. That's our Joburg culture. It's like we don't even RSVP on time. It's just, well, I don't know until I get to that week. Then I'll see if there's anything better. Then I'll RSVP. That's how we work. That's why we struggle here with the RSVPs. But I think this account, and particularly Gareth's story, reminds us that what if he had missed that particular sermon where God really met with him in the tragedy of this news? What if he just said, it's too dark. I'm just not gonna go to church. Jesus rocked up and Thomas wasn't there to see it. And I think one of the first signs that Jesus is not fully alive to you is when your heart begins to check out of community. Because that's what happened to Thomas. The Lord was, was truly dead to him. And so he didn't need community. But when you recognize Christ is risen, then you come back into community. I think the third contributing thing is tragedy. The third thing that contributes to doubt is tragedy. Just think how overwhelmingly horrendous and heinous the cross was. We discussed some of that last week and Thomas had seen it all. You know, when I read these words from Thomas and he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I'll not believe it. It's pretty graphic. And I kind of thought, 
All these images have been etched into Thomas's mind. This, he, he hasn't been sleeping since the crucifixion. Wherever he goes, he's rehearsing it. He's thinking about it. He's seen the nails go, and he's seen just the, the, the horror of Christ being crucified. And, and now when they come with this hope, it's, it's as though he relives it. And he says, well, unless this, 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 in such a graphic way. What he had seen was so dark, so traumatic, so final, there was no way that his shattered heart would entertain any other reality. And if you think about it, doubt is an alternate reality. There's truth and there's doubt. But I wonder if you've ever thought about this line of thinking which has helped me. You cannot doubt belief A unless you believe this belief over here, doubt B. The two are linked. So if you say to yourself, well, there can't just be one true religion. And so you begin to doubt truth. Uh, you've just made this statement over here, the thing that you absolutely believe without empirical evidence, just by faith. And that's what doubt is. Doubt sort of says, believe me. And we just believe it so easily, so quickly, without requiring faith of it. But if you went to the Middle East and you said, there can't just be one true religion, everyone would tell you, no, you're wrong. There's not. So not everybody thinks the same as you or believes the same doubts that you do. Therefore, every doubt is actually, in a sense, a leap of faith, a leap of faith. And why do you expect that Christianity must prove itself 100%, but you're so quick to just believe doubts that haven't proved anything to you? It would be inconsistent and hypocritical to require more justification for the truth than you do for your doubts. But that's what tragedy does. It's so real, it's so raw, it's so in our face that when it breaks into our lives, for many of us, our faith is shaken. And I think as a pastor of 25 years, how many people I've journeyed with and they can point to the date, the time, a season of injustice and they say, that's it. Gareth didn't unpack all that he went through when he walked away from God and turned to a prodigal life and didn't set foot in a church for 13 years having been a pastor himself. Doubt is often the result of a deep, deep loss in our lives. And ironically, Thomas's doubt may actually be evidence of how much he loved Christ. Underneath his doubt was actually a deep love for Christ. And so we look and we call him doubter, but there's actually somebody wrestling and we can't be harsh on Thomas because he deeply loved Christ and he's grieving. That is how somebody should grieve. So look at verses 26 and following. So a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Now I wanna give you two questions that are so helpful. I stand indebted to others. Uh, any sermon in some sense and any book that you read builds on the shoulders of others. And these two questions really, really helped me unlock this account. And the people that I got it from said that they'd got it from others. So what, what a blessing to share truth. And the first key question to unlock this encounter is this. Why does John even include the story of Thomas in his gospel? Why? Look at verse 30. Verse 30 says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. That means John has only given us a fraction of what Christ did. He said there was so much more, but I have selected, and John, more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels, is the most selective. He's chosen what he wants to focus on. So why has he got this account in here? It's not an accident. He's put it here for a particular purpose. How do we figure that out? This account is John's climax. This is what it's been building up to. And the final chapter in verse 21 is kind of just like the mopping up at the end of a movie. As the credits roll, you kind of see a few things that happen. But essentially, chapter 20, this account is the high point. Well, I'll tell you why in a moment. But the second key question that helps us understand this passage is this. Why does Jesus seem to do a double bind on Thomas? Now you think, Justin, what on earth are you talking about? But if you've read any communication books, you'll know what a double bind is. It's when you say one thing with your words, but your behavior says something else. So this is not what you should do in your marriage, but you'll understand how the double bind works in marriage. Hey, Liesl, do you mind if I go out tonight with the guys? What does she say with her words? Yeah, that's fine. If you want to go out, you can go out. I'm not gonna stop you. You don't need to stay home tonight. Go for it. 
Now I'm completely stuck. <laughs> completely stuck. I need to go for counseling because if I go out, what's she going to say to me? She can say, we've been married for how long? You knew that when I speak to you in that tone, I'm upset that you should never have gone out. That's the last thing you should do. So then what I do, I sit down and say, well, yeah, I've stayed home. But I never told you to stay home. I said the words, you could go out with your friends. That is a double bind. And it's very dangerous. And Jesus says, Thomas, you shouldn't need to see me physically. As a believer, you don't need to see me physically with your own eyes. Verse 29, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus even rebukes Thomas in a gentle way and says, stop doubting. Thomas, you don't need to see me in the flesh physically to be a Christian. And then Jesus does something exactly opposite. He shows Thomas who he is and he does the very thing that Thomas asked. So do you see this kind of double bind? You don't need this. And then he says to Thomas, okay, I'll grant your request. Why? Why? Why these two things? Well, here's the answer that brings these two key questions together. Jesus meeting Thomas has been chosen as the high point in the gospel, not because Thomas is a great doubter, but because Thomas is a great apostle. It's a great apostle. So Thomas needs to see the risen Christ physically, not as a believer, but he does as an apostle. The text calls him one of the 12. He can be a believer without seeing Christ, but he can't be an apostle without seeing Christ. Because look at verses 19 to 23, the week, the week before. The meeting the week before that Thomas has missed, if you glance there, was a meeting where Christ recommissioned the disciples. He gave them the Holy Spirit. He gave them authority to tell people how their sins will be forgiven. And Thomas the apostle has missed it. He's missed the commissioning. He's missed the spirit. He's missed information. He's missed Christ. As a believer, he shouldn't have demanded to see Christ, but as an apostle, he needed it. Why? Because the apostles had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And so for one whole week, Thomas related to the apostles as you and I relate to them today, because we also have not seen Christ in the flesh. And so John is saying to his readers, the reason he's put it in here is he's saying, I want you to trust the eyewitness testimony because we've all seen Christ, not only us, but Thomas as well. And so Thomas represents us if you're a doubter. We're all witnesses, even Thomas, and that gives doubters like you and I hope. Now think about this. Thomas knew a lot about the teaching of Jesus. If Jesus was just another guru, another good teacher, he would have died and the apostles could have just gone on and taught all the nice things that Jesus taught. Thomas didn't need this encounter with Jesus. He could have just gone on and, 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 and taught. The apostles didn't need this encounter either. But the point that John is making is there had to be eyewitnesses of the historicity of the death and resurrection of Christ, that Christianity is different from every other religion because it stakes everything on the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, we do not have a faith. It doesn't matter how wonderful I feel, what this religion does for me. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. So there had to be eyewitnesses for our benefit. You see, and modern people want the exact opposite. They just want Jesus to be a good teacher. This stuff about miracles and about death and resurrection, that's so divisive, these doctrines. You know, why can't we just all get along? You know, in fact, these legends have built up over time, but the real thing is about what Jesus taught. If we can strip away all this other nonsense and get to what he taught, you know, turn the other cheek and love one another and just bring peace to the world and joy to all mankind, that's what we need to focus on. And John says, no. No, what, what's really critical is seeing the Lord Jesus Christ risen from the grave. You see, teaching is about you, about do's and don'ts, but the gospel is about him. It's about what he has accomplished, and that's what's different. And what's Thomas's response in verse 28? Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God, there is no other place in the Gospels or perhaps in the whole of Scripture where a human being ever says something this beautifully high about Christ. Nowhere. And it comes from a doubter's lips. This is what the doubter ends up saying. So why we've given him that label? We should have given him uh, some other amazing label. My Lord and my God. 
And from the very first verse of John's gospel, John chapter one, verse one, this is what he's been desperately trying to get across, that Jesus is the son of God come in the flesh and now it reaches this high point from Thomas's lips. Do you know that you're not a Christian until you can say that? Can you this morning say, my Lord and my God? Not just declare doctrine, yes, he's Lord, yes, he's God. Can you personalize it? My Lord, my God. I get a sense that he, he just was humbled and fell to his knees. Until you can make that truth personal, you're not a believer. Not just Jesus is a nice guy, he's a you know, hang of a good teacher, he's a savior to get me through the hard times, you know, when I've got difficulties, I can pray to him. No, are you prepared to surrender him to him and bow down because he is God and Lord? I don't know how many of you know that church tradition tells us that Thomas ended up going to India. He went to India and ministered amongst the Indian people till the day he died. He was martyred for his faith in Christ, for what he had seen and what he believed. And I ask you, what would change these disciples from being weak and wimpy cowards who didn't want to believe who ran away? It was this witnessing and seeing the literal physical resurrection of Christ and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. And here's Thomas. And his testimony is left to us, to us today who have not seen, but are blessed because we have believed. Because that's what Jesus says to him in verse 29. Because you've seen me, you've believed. But blessed, there's some kind of blessing for us, for those who have seen, have not seen, and yet have believed. Well, can I leave you with just a few ways to find faith. If you're not a Christian this morning, here's some ways that you could find faith. And if you say, yes, Justin, I am a Christian, then here's some ways that will encourage you in your faith. And they're really practical and they come out of this text from this encounter with Thomas. So how to find faith if you're not a Christian, how to encourage you if you are. Number one, listen to the apostles. Listen to the apostles. Thomas didn't listen to what the apostles were telling him. And the Greek verb in verse 25 is a continuous. They kept on telling him and he kept refusing to believe. And Jesus rebukes Thomas for not listening to what the apostles had said. So yeah, it's great to read books and and I love reading books and we've got right now media and we've got all sorts of visuals and people have put stuff on YouTube and we've got sermons and we've got just so much in this day and age. But I wanna encourage you, are you listening to the apostles? Are you reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Are you saturating yourself? Are you seeing Christ touch people and and confound the critics and love people and, and touch people that are untouchable and speaking to them and answering their questions? Because if you stop listening to the eyewitness testimony, you know what happens? Your anxieties become big, your anger, your bitterness, and Jesus just becomes an abstract generalization out there. And if you're a skeptic this morning and you don't know where to start, let me challenge you. Read the Gospel of John. Start in chapter one and read through here to chapter 20. And just allow Christ to become real to you as the Holy Spirit enables you to experience him. Read the apostles and Jesus will become real. Listen to them. Number two, see how patient he's been with you. See how patient he's been with you. You know what must have dawned on Thomas when he heard those words? Thomas, here's my wounds, look at them, do what you wanted to do, put fingers in here, hands. He must have been flawed, he must have, his jaw must have dropped, he must have been humbled because he realized Jesus has been listening to me the whole time. I don't think it was as though the disciples had a private meeting to get Jesus up to speed. He realizes Jesus heard everything. My demands, my doubts, my fears, my, my grief, he, he's seen it all and yet he still loves me. He's still patient with me. And that's the blessing of the gospel is that Jesus has seen everything. He's seen the video of your mind, the moments when you even cursed God to his face. You might have shaken your fist in his face. He's seen it all. He could have struck you down. All your broken promises, all the times you failed, and yet here you sit today still with breath in your lungs, enjoying the common grace of God. He loves you. He patiently loves you. And oh, how Christ's loving patience against the backdrop of his own failings must have melted his heart. And then thirdly, To find faith or to encourage you in your faith, look at his wounds. Look at Christ's wounds. The thing that completely blew Thomas away was to see Christ's wounds. You know, I think if Jesus had shown up, if he just appeared on the spot, there'd be no crucifixion or anything, and God just kind of came in the flesh in that type of way, 
uh, and just said, Thomas, here I am, I'm God, you need to believe in me and you need to obey me. Do you know what I think would have happened? I think the same thing that used to happen to me when I was a teenager. And mom, I think you're in the service this morning so you know the state of my room back in those days. But when I was a teenager, maybe it was a very, very rare occasion when I decided, sure, I think I wanna clean my room. It's really got to you know, extravagant proportions. Now is the time, I wanna do this, but, but I'm doing it for myself. Doing it for myself, that's why I'm cleaning the room. So I get up from the TV, imagine me going towards my room, I'm about to clean it, and down the passage comes mom. And what does mom say? Justin, have you seen the condition of your room? You really need to clean that room. What's going on in my heart at that moment? Mom, I'll do it when I'm ready. I do a U-turn and I go back and sit down in front of the TV. Why do I do that? Because that's how rebellious the human heart can be. I'll do it if I'm doing it on my time for me, but I'm not gonna do it because you commanded me. So, and I think you might be the same. Maybe you're just all too polite. Say, oh, I respect my mom, you know. I was a but, but if you won't do it for your mom, do you really think you're gonna do it for the God of the universe when he comes with his list of do's and don'ts, just religion? You won't. The only thing that will break through a hard heart is to see the wounds of Christ. To see the wounds of Christ. God was not a fool to send us another great teacher There's enough religions and isms on this planet. We don't need another one. We don't need another expert. We don't need, you know why? Because we've never listened to the teachers. The do's and don'ts have always made us do things that we didn't wanna do because as I said last time, when I tell you don't look at the spider, you all look at the spider. So the the do's and don'ts don't actually help us. There's only one site that will break through this ambivalence that we have with God. We want God and yet we hate him at the same time. And every time we're looking for a relationship, you know what, I think it's really Jesus we're after. Every time we're seeking for happiness here and we end up empty, you know who it's really, we're really after, it's Christ. When we're climbing the the career, you know who I think we're really after, it's Christ. It's Jesus we're really after. And when we listen to beautiful music and we move, it's Jesus we're really after. And yet our hearts will say, I will not give up my independence, I will not. That will destroy me. There's this ambivalence. And the only thing that'll break through is to see a wounded God. Not just a God who's appeared, not just another man, but a God man who says, look what I did for you. You don't believe that. You don't believe that there's a God that would love you so much that he would go to the cross, that he wouldn't be able to stand the distance, the relational distance, that he would go to the cross to be your substitute. That's what blasted through Thomas's fears and it's the only thing that'll blast through ours. And there's no other religion on this planet that would even dare to say that their God has wounds, that their God is a God of weakness who was nailed to a cross. Look at his wounds. Look at his wounds. And then number four. This is my final point. Drop your conditions. Drop your conditions. We don't ever read that Thomas went and poked his finger in the wounds of Christ. I think he he had enough sense to stop short of doing that. Even though he could have, and even though Jesus invited him to do that, he realized that he had demanded a condition. And I think that many people first come to God in that way. They they have a condition. God, if you do X for me, then I will follow you. Lord, if if, if you heal me. Lord, if you uh, let my father uh, come out of that hospital. Lord, if you get me through the exams. Lord, if you get me that girlfriend or boyfriend, if I'm able to marry that guy, Lord, then I'll follow you. I will come to you if X. I will obey you if X. But do you know what that means? Whatever your X is, is actually your savior. That is your savior. And that X will never die for you, but it will demand that you die for it. And you might be sitting in church this morning and you're not a Christian because you have not dropped your conditions. You have not bowed to your knee and said, my Lord and my God, no ifs, no buts, no conditions. Only then are you a Christian if you can say, Lord, it's because of what you have done for me. And I encourage you to come. There's a lady this morning at the eight o'clock service who's never been to Rosebank before. She doesn't even know why she came here. Broken, absolutely broken. Came to the front and said, do you know that I've been holding this particular condition over God and that's why I've never turned to him to this day. And she said, I realized this morning I need to let it go. 
And so John ends by issuing an invitation to you. He says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. For seven weeks we've been looking at people Jesus met. Can I ask you, has Jesus met you? What a tragedy to have watched him meet others and for you yourself to have never met him. You can come today. He's closer than you think. You can repent of your sins and you can come knowing that he's seen it all and he's willing to love you despite of anything that you've done. Come today and surrender to him. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for mercy and grace. I thank you, Lord, even as we sang Amazing Grace and we thought back, as I thought back to that day when I bowed the knee to you, Lord, I remember that rebellious heart. I remember the wrestling. I remember not wanting to bow the knee. I, I wanted to be Lord. I wanted to be independent. And yet at the same time, there was an emptiness. And Lord, I just thank you for the story of Thomas, who's so much like us. And Lord, we recognize that we have given him this label, and he's so much deeper than this label. Lord, he was actually a great saint who, who went and served you till his dying day because he had seen you. And Lord, indeed, the apostles were so privileged to see you risen physically. And we come to you by faith off the basis of their eyewitness testimony. Lord, we thank you that you haven't given us just one account. You've given us four. Lord, thank you for your spirit that makes Christ real to us. Thank you that we can encounter you today because you're still the living Lord Jesus Christ who even this morning, after eight o'clock, met with a lady and she met with you. And Lord, I, I thank you for meeting with Gareth and with Trudy and for each one here. Lord, for any that don't know you, I just pray that, that their doubts and their fears would be swallowed up as they begin to investigate, as they begin to read, as they begin to think. Thank you, Lord, that our faith is not, as Richard Dawkins says, just a blind faith, it's just a plaster we slap on stuff when there's no evidence. Thank you that our faith, biblical faith, is trust. And Lord, we know enough, we have experienced enough to be able to trust you. And Lord, what's the point of looking at a chair and thinking it can hold us, but not entrusting ourselves to it by faith? I pray that we would be those this morning that hand our lives over to you. That don't just believe that you are Lord and God, but actually you are my Lord and God. May we own our faith. May we experience you. May we be able to say, I am his and he is mine, as the hymn writer says. Thank you, Jesus, that you walked on the waters. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross. Thank you that you have purposes and plans for us even today. Thank you for giving us what we don't deserve. None of us deserve mercy or grace. Lord, you are a holy and just and righteous God, and we only deserve your wrath. But thank you that you made a way. And thank you, Lord, that we don't have to climb this ladder of religion, do, 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 to get to you. You've come down the ladder, and you've... You've reached into our brokenness. You've come and done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so here we stand, Lord. We are sinners. And apart from you, we can do nothing. We are simply sinners saved by your grace. Keep us humble. Keep us questioning and asking. Keep us seeking after truth. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Thank you, Lord, that you're here today and you may still be found because there's breath in our lungs. Work the gospel into our lives again today, we pray. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.